Welcome to Frankly Speaking with Dr. Wade. This show was created for and inspired by the thousands of patients I've served. So it's time for me to speak up and speak out on their behalf. With a wide range of experts, we bring you weekly insights diving deep into topics of controversy to bust through the sugar coating that keeps you and your family stuck in the mainstream. So good day. How's it going, uh, Frank- Dr. Wade? Today we have our special guest, Dr. Michael Vander Sheldon. He hails from California. He is uh, an author, a chiropractor, a husband, an athlete. So uh, today we're going to actually, the, the name of his book is a, The Scientific Approach to Intermittent Fasting. So thanks for being here with us today, Dr. Michael. You got it, Dr. Wade. It's my pleasure. For Dr. Mike, for Dr. Mike. Dr. Mike, keep it easy. Okay. You got it easy. <laughs> all right. So tell, tell us a little bit about yourself, first of all. Well, um, as you mentioned, I am a chiropractor. Always had a uh, huge interest in just increasing the function of my body any way I could. And so that really steered me into things like um, exercise techniques, nutrition, just any way to get that extra edge that was in my control. And I, that's really just kind of been taking most of my attention. What I do mostly in my extracurricular time is just really focus on ways that I can do that better, my function in ways that I can directly control. Cool. So how did you get into the chiropractic profession, the natural healthcare profession to begin with? I mean, that was an easy choice for me, you know, growing up, personal trainer for several years uh, while I was in college with, uh, you know, and I thought I was going to go into dentistry following the parents' footsteps, if you will. And I kind of had everything set in place to follow that route, you know, majored with a pre-dental degree, but also had uh, minors in kinesiology as well. But when I was applying for dental school, I just kind of had this like, just this thought, just kind of this wake up where I'm like, I really don't want to be looking in a mouth all day. That really just was away from my passion. I think I was focused on more things like financial gains because it was kind of all set up for me to take over. But I ended up just doing a abrupt 180, totally stopped taking interviews, didn't want to do that anymore. And instead looked at things that I was really involved with in like the human body and exercise, nutrition, and chiropractic really seemed to fit the mold You know, you're talking about a drugless profession aimed at increasing the function of the body, increasing the posture, the stature of the human being. And so that really was just the perfect fit for me. And I didn't know much about it at the time, but I knew chiropractic really just seemed to, uh, it it caught my attention. And so I enrolled right away, moved to California from Seattle and, uh, you know, four years later, got my degree. So you, uh, your parents have practiced both dentists. Uh, my mom's a hygienist, dad's a dentist. Uh, they're up in Seattle, um, obviously retired now, but, uh, you know, he had about four or five offices still does. And so really just helped me pave the way, you know, he wanted me to take over in his footsteps, right? go and run his practices, you know, because he wanted to retire, but you know, you got to do what you want to do. And <laughs> that was something that kind of, he wanted for me, but it just wasn't my passion. Beautiful. You know, that's perfect too. I mean, I think we all go through a lot of the shoulds in our life, you know, based on, uh, I know I did what I, what I could be doing, should be doing. I've had patients ask me, you know, so why didn't you get into medicine? Why, why weren't you a medical doctor? Right. I I do not and cannot see the body that way with my upbringing. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just, I'm just geared to see it as, as more holistic. And that, that's just, so I couldn't even do it. I mean, it wasn't my, my Dick, like it sounds like you're sure. just following, following your heart, but so cool. All roads leading towards health and fitness in your case, and then you know structure and function, like you're uh, talking about. You had you were telling me about some of the road uh, that in your early days of practice and how you literally were just you were grinding it out. I mean, some people think we have like cush hours, but yet there's a lot of intensity that goes into patient care, a lot of attention that has to be there, our awareness, our ability to focus, our ability to problem solve on our feet. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's physical to adjust my technique. I'm, I'm less physical because I used to be very physical with it. So I got smart over time and, and I, I use a technique that I get to stand up all day, like vertical and uh, I'm not bending over, lifting, twisting, cranking, popping sort mm-hmm. of thing. But the physical side of that has a wear and tear, but the, 
what I found fascinating, you at a young age really caught on to how the phys- the physical grind, but the the long hours, the volume of patients you were seeing, and the the type of office you were working in was kind of just you got some really you got your feet wet and exposed really quickly, and also learned pretty quickly. Like I can't do this my whole life, and so yeah. where did you where, tell us just briefly about kind of what you saw, how you how you took that and, you know, and, and how it moved you into that next piece where you started to move that direction, A, in the functional, you know, the restore regenerative side, as well as different way of handling patient care. Yeah. I really find that experience to be, uh, you know, I'm really happy and thankful for that experience. I had one of the best mentors anyone could ever have, Dr. John Bergman. You know, most of you have probably seen him on YouTube and things like that, you know huge, well-known chiropractor out there. And he just taught me so much just from getting out of school. And, you know, he had his, the biggest practice in Huntington beach, really in Southern California. And I joined the team, um, upon graduation in, uh, 2013. And it was great. You know, I was, I had a job, first of all, you know, when you're graduating, that's one of your biggest stresses. So I had a guaranteed job right there and I was excited about it, but when you're doing a uh, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. type of shift, you know, every single day, four days a week, it, and you're seeing just me individually over 100 patients a day, you know, the practice together was seeing roughly 250 to 300 patients a day. And so it was, you know, it really was like a, a crazy madhouse in that practice. Super fun. I loved my experience there. But, I mean, when you give out all of your physical, mental, emotional energy on a daily basis, you come home and you're just like shot. And so all those things that I've also had passions of, you know, getting my, you know, online presence up and running, doing things I was passionate about with nutrition and exercise, all these things. I literally just had no energy to even look at those things because the job I was focused on just took away everything. And I love that experience. I learned so much. And so I wouldn't trade it for the world, but it definitely taught me something um, in the realm of how I really didn't want to practice for the rest of my life. Great. Yeah. And and I think that's an important piece too, is looking back on that experience and realizing it's positive, but there's a lesson Mm -hmm. in the positive. And now you have choices, whether you want to, it's like, Oh, this is, I guess what it, what it has to be to be successful. And yet you were, you were wise enough to say, no, there is another way which yep. led you and in, in turned your path, whether it be one degree or 15 degrees uh-huh. or whatever it might uh-huh. be. And so that took you next step. Where, where'd you go from there? So the next step, uh, what I ended up doing is I opened up a regenerative medicine practice, kind of like an integrated health center. And at this center, we, you know, there was chiropractic and we also had a medical staff there, but the medical staff, we weren't doing your traditional medical procedures out there. It was still aimed at that philosophy of bettering one's function without the use of drugs or surgery. And so what we were doing is we were using people's platelet rich plasma to increase regeneration of people's cartilage, ligaments, tendons, you know, repairing muscle injuries, things of that nature, but also too working with things like stem cell therapy and if someone has any type of pretty degenerative arthritis in a joint in their spine, if it's really, really advanced, people are pretty much going to be steered in one direction. And that's getting a type of fusion surgery in the spine or some type of like joint replacement in a joint. And so we were founding that with the treatments we were utilizing was super cool because we were actually able to prevent a lot of those invasive procedures. So giving patients you know, like with chiropractic, increase function, increase ability to move, increase their quality of life without the uses of full knee replacements, full joint replacements, fusion surgeries, which as you know, is quite dangerous. And the success rate is pretty, uh, it's pretty low. Pretty low. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. And so while you were doing that, you authored a book. I did. I had to get up at, I think three or four in the morning. Yep. Good memory. Good memory. Yeah. So (laughs) this is actually, I actually wrote the book the last year of working, um, in that first office I was telling you about. And so when your hours are six to six, I mean, I had no time to 
right during those hours. And for me, I was always been a morning person. And the only way I could kind of get in that writing mode is to get up early and have like those few hours of uninterrupted time where I can get my stuff done. And so that's when I decided to write the book on intermittent fasting. I was always practice, practicing it. I did several YouTube lectures on intermittent fasting, and they were some of the most popular, uh, had the most hits on those lectures. So I knew it was a hot topic. People were really looking for that stuff. And it's free, quite frankly. It's a free lifestyle intervention people can apply. And so I did that for a period of about a year, getting up at 3 in the morning every day and having about two and a half uninterrupted hours of time to really focus and get my... I was fasting too. So that already increased my brain function in that morning hours. And I was able to, you know, really get a good amount of work done before I actually started the real job. And it it ended up working out, but it was not a healthy lifestyle habit. I don't wish that upon anybody sacrificing a ton of sleep, but uh, I'm glad I did it. Right. And and you, currently you don't have kids, right? Not yet. So yeah. you're you're able to you um we just discussed but your your wife's also a chiropractor. She is. She's a pediatric right. chiropractor. Yep. Yep. So cool. Two rock stars. So um let's move into the book part because when I looked first of all when I met you and I I grabbed your book right thereafter. Uh I met uh Dr. Mike at a conference. And so right off the bat, I just like, I got to go talk to this guy about his book because I had started intermittent fasting and mm -hmm. I know there's a ton of questions around intermittent, intermittent fasting as well as the ketogenic diet. And there's also tons of myths and myths, myth understanding. That's not a lisp. It's a mm -hmm. myth understanding <laughs> and the myth conceptions out there and all these just, it's crazy. You're, you're, you're sitting on a plane or you're sitting in a restaurant, you're, you're overhearing somebody in line somewhere and they're talking about, oh, I tried that, but it didn't. What? And then you, mm -hmm. you find out more information that all they did was add fat, you know, or they're adding more calories with nothing else changed. And so there's this big misunderstanding who can, who can't, it's unhealthy, it's healthy, uh, it's not for everyone, blah, blah, blah. blah. So mm -hmm. let's get into some meat for the listeners specifically about, first of all, let me backtrack just a once one minute frankly speaking with dr wade is about our patients it's not about me it's about me coming clear on communicating something that i've been uh not communicating as mm -hmm. a result of being busy in my practice and having you know a lot of a lot of demands with teaching and whatnot that didn't allow me to get into this avenue well i realize the importance and the value for a lot of our listeners the patients the conversations i have every day is patients are stuck with taking information and applying it to themselves. In other words, they might have one foot in the medical model and they have one foot in an alternative provider, whether it be an acupuncturist, a chiropractor, massage therapy, a naturopath. And yet when the quote unquote shit hits the fan or when something happens, they're pretty much stuck. They lean into the medical model because of the fear and the fear induced on that side. And what this is about is uncovering some real resources that are scientific, like your book, like what you're representing, to give patients footing, foundation, groundwork mm -hmm. to build their health from in a holistic side rather than feel fearfully pulled or coerced into this other side and that this is okay when I'm feeling good, but when I need health, then I got to go back here. Mm -hmm. So it's a segue to why you're here, why I love what you're doing, why I love yeah. the book, Intermittent Fasting, with the young, youthful, ripped Michael. <laughs> All right. So tell us about your book. Tell us yeah. what you loved most about it. First of all, like researching it, yeah. what you learned. I mean, you obviously got better with it after you wrote no. the book, didn't you? I, I did. I did. Totally. And one thing about intermittent fasting or just fasting in general is that that's the one lifestyle intervention that's always been present upon human existence. We've always done it. Our ancestors alternated between feast and famine. They didn't have food available 24 hours around the clock. You know, they would go through quite a long periods of time in a famine state without any food, where food was completely scarce, right? So we've done this ever since human existence. Almost every single religion involves some type of fasting, you know, whether that's Muslim, Catholic, you name it. It's, it's, it's a big presence. And if you dive deeper, you really find out that your body's biological and repair mechanisms really turn on in those periods of food scarcity. And 
to really, before we really jump in that, I think it's important to really understand this hormone insulin, because this is what is really causing all of the problems that we're experiencing today with. We've learned this back in biochemistry and chiropractic school and professional school that insulin is a storage hormone, right? So if you consume food, especially carbohydrates, it's going to release insulin, which is going to signal your body to stop lipolysis or fat burning and instead store your fat. So we know this. And we also know that two thirds of Americans is overweight, yep. is obese, right? And so what we want to do is we want to actually stimulate fat burning and we want to prevent storing fat. That's the solution. And so that's completely the opposite effects of insulin. So if we can find a lifestyle intervention that focuses on insulin, then I think we're really onto something. And it just so happens that fasting really is your answer for that. And it kind of makes sense why it's been used upon human existence ever since, you know, back then till today, it's been widely utilized and our body gets so much benefits in return. And so it's really powerful. And a couple other things that is important is that in regards to insulin, I wrote this thing down here. Almost every single chronic disease is linked to insulin resistance because we're always constantly eating. Mostly it's refined carbohydrates causing insulin to always be high. And eventually your body just stops responding to that, to that, you know, that really that, that signal. For those who don't necessarily understand what insulin resistance is, tell right. us how you get, you're starting to tell, just for clarification, tell sure. her, speak on how insulin, insulin resistance develops. Right. So if your dog's barking in the background, at first it's really annoying, right? But if that dog continues to bark in the background, pretty soon you're just going to kind of ignore it and you're going to be kind of come immune to it. Same thing as insulin. If you constantly are eating refined carbohydrates, eating all day, every day, every single hour, your insulin is always going to be raised. And so we talked about how insulin is a storage hormone. And so it's signaling the body to turn all that excess carbohydrates into fat and store that fat. But after a while, if the insulin's always elevated, your body just kind of stops reacting to that same stimulus. And so that's what happens. You get elevated insulin and glucose because your body just doesn't know what to do with that anymore. And that, in turn, leads to almost every single chronic disease out there known to man and woman. You know, So it's crazy. And so insulin resistance we know is not good. We also know that insulin and growth hormone are indirectly related. If you have high insulin, your body doesn't release growth hormone, which has to do with growth, repair, rejuvenation. And so if insulin gets out of whack, we get chronic disease. We get no growth hormone release. We get fat. We get obese. You know, you get all these problems. And so we got to find a lifestyle intervention that really helps normalize insulin and actually makes it super sensitive in the body so we can function at our best. And that's exactly where fasting and also things like the ketogenic diet comes into play. Boom. Boom. Perfect. Next, where do you want to go with that? So what, what else do people stumble on? Well, now that you get insulin and you start to understand what creates it and you look at yeah. carbohydrates in addition to refined mm -hmm. carbohydrates, where does that take you? mTOR, you want to talk oh, about, a, a, I mean, let's talk about apophagy. Right. Yeah. Apophagy. That's one big thing. So I always like to, relate this to ancestors because it kind of can give people a clear um, example of where this goes. If our ancestors, if food was scarce for a period of time, which it often was, if that caused our ancestors to lose muscle mass, to lower their energy, then we wouldn't be here today, right? So it was something about that food scarcity that actually prevented muscle loss, that increase people's energy and heighten mental acuity and all of these things, because otherwise they wouldn't have any other response to do, but then just like sit there with, you know, in a complete lag of energy and eventually die. But that's not what happens. And so a lot of that comes down to growth hormone. When you're not eating growth hormone spikes, which increases your growth repair. It also increases norepinephrine, and some of these stress hormones that heighten mental acuity, heighten mental focus, 
It increases specific stem cells in your brain to help with your memory and concentration and build new memory. And so you're having all of these mechanisms that actually get turned on by not eating, which seems counterintuitive, right? I mean, I remember back in the day when I was a trainer, <laughs> I was trying to eat every two hours, every single day, pounding protein shakes, because I always thought that that was what was going to increase my testosterone and growth hormone at its maximum. Bingo. And, Me too. Yeah, right. And it, <laughs> and it turns out it did work. I did put on mass, but if you're going for like a combination of having healthy muscle mass, but also having some longevity, you really got to combine the fasting and the working out together. And so that's what we're finding here. And the, the research is at this point, pretty outstanding. Yeah. So Whew. I just made a note about apophagy, recycling weaker, just a, a quick analogy. It was recycling weaker cells and cell waste, the body's natural eating of old cell material. What do you want mm -hmm. to say? Like you got fasting, which I've talked to many patients about intermittent and the, the fear part comes up right away of, oh my gosh, that's not eating. I would starve until they kind of get over the, the fact that you're really not starving. You're just opening up windows of not eating to, and narrowing down windows of eating. So can right. you get into epophagy from the standpoint in your version, you know, your simplified version of it, because it's really clean and clear mm -hmm. and then how to stimulate it. And then what that means is someone who's fighting chronic infections, chronic sinus, uh, maybe they have cancer, something along those lines where you apply some of this to that and they can see a bridge. Mm -hmm. So a good analogy with that is, and I, th I think that most people can think with, is let's just look at um, your bones, healthy bone formation. You have two types of cells in your bones. You have osteoblasts and osteoclasts. So the osteoblasts are responsible for forming brand new healthy bone. Your osteoclasts are responsible for kind of getting rid of all your damaged, brittle, crappy bone. So you have this healthy balance of regenerating bone and breaking out all the, the crap and, you know, the loose ends there. And so your bone has a perfectly, you know, physiological mechanism of building up healthy bone tissue and releasing all the crap. And that's the same thing as autophagy. Fasting stimulates your body to, you know, basically it's kind of like the cellular recycling, getting rid of all this damage, uh, cellular damage, cellular debris, um, you know, uh, damage DNA, all that kind of stuff. It's able to get rid of that. And then it also in turn helps you rebuild brand new, you know, you know, body tissue, if you will. And so it's this way of your body recycling, just like your body's bones do that. And so it's very similar. And you can think if you're having chronic disease, if you're having sinus issues, all of that stuff, it's not saying that autophagy and fasting is going to completely cure that. But one thing you always want to do is instead of thinking what's going to cure my sinus issues, just think what's going to increase the function and the health of my body overall. And anytime you can repair your tissues and get brand new body, healthy tissue and human growth and repair, that's obviously going to help your body function overall. And it doesn't really matter what illness or, you know, symptom we're talking about, that's going to help everything. So really focusing on the body as a whole at regenerating its system. Cool. So I, I like the way you put it. Um, there's a lot of excitement around the word mTOR. How do you feel about that? And what would you like to expand on there? Yeah. mTOR is, uh, it's, it's still, <laughs> they're still finding out so many things for research, right? That, you know, mTOR, what does this mean? Because mTOR really helps you put on muscle mass, first of all. So when your body is exercising, strength training, when you're consuming a, uh, post-workout meal that's elevating mTOR, which is helping you put on healthy muscle mass. But at the same time, we you found that if mTOR is elevated all the time, that actually will diminish your longevity and your lifespan. And so you obviously want a healthy medium, if you will, just like insulin. Insulin is not bad. Chronic elevated insulin is bad. But you obviously need to have insulin to actually store tissue, and it actually has some anabolic properties as well. So you want these things in a cyclical fashion, right? And so for working out, for doing all those things, for you know consuming a post-workout meal to help with your protein synthesis, you want mTOR elevated. 
on those other hours out of the day, you want to keep it suppressed. And that's what's actually been shown to increase the greatest amount of longevity and health. And one thing that keeps mTOR low when you want it to is fasting, which makes sense because you're not constantly consuming food. Insulin drops, your body's repair mechanisms kick in, and mTOR drops. And all of that really helps you lead to this longevity and really enhanced lifespan. And I don't think anyone would, uh, you know, say no to an increased longevity and lifespan. And so that's what's cool with mTOR. They're learning, we're learning more and more, you know, as the day goes on. But for what we know now, it seems that fasting really helps keep that in check, keeps it low when we need it. But also too, it's going to elevate when you do things like strength training and refeeding, which is good. Right. Yeah. I think that refeeding point is, uh, is interesting. And then the, the, the cool thing is the graduated levels that people can actually enter this, right? I mean, they can start intermittent fasting. So let, give me an example of how you tend to recommend it. Cause I know how I tend to do it with patients, um, mm-hmm. based on, again, some knowledge from your book, which is awesome, but understanding it more, it, it, it drove some, some deeper passion for me to really get clear on that because I kept seeing and hearing the myths around it and the fears. For example, I'd had patients come in who are on a ketogenic plan already that they found somewhere on the internet or a friend mm-hmm. at it. And they'll lose five to seven pounds in the first seven, 10, 15 days and boom, plateau. Come in, they're stuck, their weight's not going, but hey, I'm doing the diet. I've, I, we look at something in our office where we look at macros and be able to determine by testing the body physically whether they're digesting mm-hmm. carbohydrates, fats, or proteins. And in many cases, these folks aren't digesting their fats. So it's really predictable. You know, some simple things we do to help open that up, and all of a sudden the ketogenesis starts working again. But, mm-hmm. I mean, from your standpoint, you get to see a wide range of patients. There are some, um, there are some patients that specifically type 1 diabetics, uh, sure. someone with, with deep-seated biliary problems, it has to be cautionary on the ketogenic diet. But... Mm-hmm. You've seen that as well. Is there any, so that's ketogenesis. Is there an intermittent fasting red flag? Is there a fasting red flag? I mean, I know of them. What do you particularly see with your patients and where would you caution anyone yeah. attempting to intermittent fast? What, what should mm-hmm. they look for if something's not safe for them? So the people who should not intermittent fast, let's just get that out of the way. Um, pregnant females, Yep. Kids, kids and people who are trying to put on muscle mass. Now we know that fasting is a really good way at conserve, conserving lean muscle mass. You can also, even with keto, it does have a protein sparing effect, but it is a little bit more difficult to actually build lean muscle when you're not eating, you know, because you're taking away a huge anabolic stimulus. And so if you're trying to put on a lot of weight, maybe like you're a uh, football player and you're really trying to put on weight or you're just doing something for like vanity reasons and want to just get as super jacked up as you can. Um, fasting and keto is probably not what you want to do because it's not really going to get you to that level. You know, the, it's not the easiest way to do that. Right. Now, if you're doing, if you want something like healthy lean muscle mass, but also have all of those health properties that fasting gives you increased longevity, all of that, then that's where you really want to go with that. And so that's the people that who should not do it. Now, the way the approach I like to use is if you're just taking your eating window and most people like to eat first thing in the morning. And then since their diet usually sucks. And what I mean by sucks is they're usually eating a high amount of refined carbohydrates. They're going to have a huge insulin spike and then fall. And when that insulin falls, you're going to get hungry again, which causes people to want to eat every few hours because those carbohydrates have a very spiky energy pathway where as fat metabolism, as you know, is more of this constant steadily energy stores. And so I like to just, you know, when you, when we say the word breakfast, breakfast means the meal that breaks your fast. That's what it means. You never said it's the first thing in the morning, right? When you get up, right? right? Because, because when you wake up, guess what? Your body already is, your body is very intelligent. It already has this natural surge of cortisol, of norepinephrine. 
So your art, your body already naturally without food is increasing its energy sources, its energy substrates with the cortisol and the norepinephrine. They make you more alert. You don't need a, you know, a huge bowl of Cheerios to stimulate that pathway even more. Your body already does it naturally. And so for me, and I think for most people, delaying or knocking out breakfast is the easiest approach to start with this. You know, you're not going to starve yourself. You're still going to be eating lunch, dinner. You're still really going to be eating roughly the same amount of calories. You're just delaying that first meal of the day or possibly like I do, I just eliminate the first meal of the day. Yeah. And so that's how I like to do it. That's what I find um, suitable for most people because then if your first meal is, let's say, lunch, you're eating lunch and dinner. So let's say your first meal is at 12 noon, last meal is around 6 or 7. So you really your eating window is from 12 to 8 p.m. And so those other 16 hours around the clock, you're not consuming any food. And that's vastly different than what most people do. And I find it very easy. Obviously, if someone, and this is important too, because nothing in life that is like worth obtaining that gives you so many great results, you got to put in some effort, right? And so if your body's expecting this meal first thing in the morning, and it's been expecting that meal for 40 plus years, however long you've trained your body to expect that meal, the first day going without that meal, your body's going to kind of go through a little shock and that's okay. You know, this isn't going to a little revolt. Yeah. And you know, cause you're, you've programmed your body to expect this big chunk of nutrition at that hour when you don't give it at that time, you know, it, it changes a little bit. So you will be hungry at first, but just like with keto, same thing, you know, you go through that kind of keto flu that a lot of people talk about those first couple of weeks of transitioning, same thing with fasting. Cause you're really going into ketosis as well is your body goes through that little shock at first, but then after a couple of weeks, you start to notice that not only do you are not hungry in the morning, you actually feel better in the morning. You know, that's why my prime hours are in the morning before I have my first meal. And that's what I've found out that I get my best, deepest work amount done when I'm during those fasting periods where I'm not eating. And now we know why with the increases in brain function and all of that. I would second that in terms of focus, ability to just be productive. I mean, the most cognitive strength is in that fasting time. And, and, uh, there's a, there's also confusion around the getting away with like getting away with carbohydrates or getting away with uh, this much. Yeah. But what, when I'm reminded as to what we're really doing in the transition, so it doesn't matter about keto or ketosis all the time. What matters is have you awakened your ancestral mm-hmm. genetic code to start burning the most efficient fuel we have. Yes, absolutely. And fasting, if you do a traditional intermittent fasting regimen, you know, I call it the 16, eight method where you're eating for eight hours, fasting for 16 hours during those 16 hours, your body is dipping into those low levels of ketosis. When you consume food, it's getting out of it. So you're doing this cyclical ketosis, which I think is fantastic. People can always take it a step further and during their eight hour eating window, only consume ketogenic type foods, high in fats, moderate protein, low in carbohydrates to maintain that ketosis level. But it's really not necessary for most people. Really that cyclical fashion, just you getting from fasting alone is enough to get them a lot of benefits. So we're, what we're really, I want to just br- bridge a couple gaps of what we're yeah. talking about here with Dr. Mike specifically is if you just decide to do intermittent fasting on a super easy path, which starts out 12 hours, last mm-hmm. meal, you're done eating by seven at night, or let's just say it's 8 p.m. for whatever reason. If you're a business traveler, mm-hmm. it might be nine. Go not, go 12 hours, you're at 9 a.m. You skip your breakfast to the point where now you drag it out. Let's just say you're starting from scratch. Go till 10. Yeah. yeah. Do that a couple days you'll find you're still alive and you really haven't bitten anyone's head off on the second and third day. (laughs) Absolutely. Instead of eliminating breakfast at first, just delay breakfast at first. Great starting points. Instead of 8 a.m., go to 9, go to 10. And so you're just slowly increasing that fasting window. And then gradually, yeah. And so where do they want to get to, Dr. Mike? What's a a good, like you said, Mm 16-8. How long could it take them to get to 16 hours? Excuse Um, me. (laughs) it, 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 It depends on the person. A lot of times, you know, for me, 
I'm willing to put my body through a pretty uh, abnormal amount of discomfort and pain because I just like to try things. And so I can push through it. And even though I might uh, regret it for those next three days, I, I'm kind of someone that can go all in. But for our patients, I think that might, those, those, uh, that kind of rough three period transition time might discourage them from going further. So just delaying it until they feel really good. You know, if they can get to 12 and 12, 12 hour fasting windows, I think that's a good for most people. But if there's someone that still wants to take that function to the next level, I think going more towards a 14 to 16 hour fast is probably most beneficial. And certainly you can do longer fasts, throw in 24 hour fasts along the way, you know, so, which is something I do quite often. Um, but it's keeping it simple, just trying to keep that eating window, you know, 12 hours or less, I think is a very good start for people to get some pretty good benefits. Can you verify the, I know there's, I've read multiple different resources where they're not quite sure, or maybe you do know, uh, or where your camp is in terms of autophagy, when does it actually start? Some I heard like 16 or some not till 18 hours. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, from what I've read, majority of the research on fasting is, is looking at 24 hour fasts, you know, especially, uh, there was just a paper out of MIT that talked about increasing the rejuvenation power of stem cells, which is in very high relation to autophagy after 24 hour fast, but people hear that word 24 hour fast. It's really not as hard as you think it could be. It's eating dinner the night before and then not eating till dinner the next day. So you're not actually going technically a full day. You're just going 24 hours of not eating. And so that's how I do my 24 hour fast dinner to dinner. And so really what it comes down to, if you're doing a 16, eight method of intermittent fasting, instead of eating that first meal at lunch, keep it at dinner and you'll get a 24 hour fast that way, which is pretty cool. And so a lot of this research out there is looking at 24 hours, but intermittent fasting has also been shown to keep weight down. So in in terms of the fat loss potential, the increases in your, in your changes in your structure and your body mass, a lot of those can be done with intermittent fasting, but a lot of the autophagy, a lot of the increasing in mitochondrial density, things of that nature are usually with 24 hour fasts or longer. Okay. Got it. So we're really not, we're really not turning on the autophagy that we know of. We don't know. They didn't say like, Oh, you do this, but when they're doing a, when they're doing fasting research, most of them will kind of look at it just a simple 24 hour fast instead of doing these intermittent fasting intervals. And and, then looking at measurements. Okay. Got it. So no, thank you. That's helpful. I I know there's questions around the benefits. Some people are in a really deep hole with Mm -hmm. their health. And so it's like, if we think we're doing something that's working, but it technically we're not even hitting it. For example, when I started intermittent fasting and I was cheating with some keto coffee, I wasn't even intermittent fasting. And then you hear that caffeine is okay. And it doesn't break your fast. If it's just straight caffeine, you have an opinion there. Um, Uh, Some teas. I do. Go go ahead. Well, well, coffee. So you have researched by Sachin Panda and he's, he does time restricted eating. And he argues that anything other than water breaks your fast because anything other than water has got to be metabolized by your body, even if it has no calories. However, there isn't like a ton of research showing that coffee or any of like, or, you know, a couple drops of lemon and water or anything are really doing that much, you know, negative stuff. And when you look at coffee research in general, coffee actually causes your uh, glycogen to release sugar, which is good. You're releasing stored energy. It stimulates fat burning and actually stimulates, stimulates lipolysis. So if you combine just black organic coffee with a fasting period, that can actually benefit some of those, um, already found benefits with fasting. So it just kind of furthermore helps with that and things like adding cinnamon in your coffee as well, which is calorie free, but also too, that has sugar lowering properties. So all these things actually seem to benefit your fast. And for me, it's a lot easier to go through a fast if I have my coffee. And so if I have my coffee, because you're also got to kind of have this balance in your life of benefits and also enjoyment. And I think having that coffee is actually doing both. It's allowing me to enjoy those periods of fasting, but it also seems to actually help a lot of those benefits as well. 
I, I, I appreciate that. I, I would agree with the fat mobilization part about it. That's one thing that I've seen. Um, and, and I would agree. And that's what I also love about what this whole message is around IF, intermittent fasting, mm-hmm. is that it isn't torturous. It is not depravity. It is literally fine-tuning, like you said, that consuming period where we're stressing our body with digestion. Uh, by the way, I mean, this is a whole nother topic, but part of the reason that I dug into this books, your book specifically, and then the facts around it, which I'm highly recommending if, if those of you can't tell, but the point is there's so much information about applying it. And when you Mm -hmm. understand what Dr. Mike brought up with his book, and then he builds around that with the understanding, it just, he puts it in great lay terms to do that. But the fat when we don't digest foods well, and we're constantly loading our system and that insulin is spiking because your body's, needing to put that sugar somewhere, you're using your immune system to break down your food. Yeah. Chronic inflammation, chronic degenerative disease, that's, that's why we're seeing patients. That's why they come in is they are having body signs, body markers that are mm-hmm. results of inflammation, structural, chemical, physiological, and emotional. 100%. And, and so 100%. this is back to nuts and bolts to go, all right, how are we helping your back pain and your neck pain? Watch what you're eating, how you're eating. It still comes back to the metabolic syndromes that we're creating. Right. And you're taking them out of the stress response. Right. Yeah. And one of the, one of the uh, signs of being in a stress response is elevated insulin and elevated blood sugar because your body is needing some of those energy substrates because it's expecting this fight or flight environment. You know, unfortunately, instead of being hunted by an animal like our ancestors were, now we're trying to make deadlines and pounding coffee after coffee to meet these deadlines and watching countless hours of TV, getting low sleep, you know, all of these things. So our stress response, the stimulus has changed, but that physiological mechanism has not changed. (laughs) Well said. Well said. The body is an adaptive machine. And if you keep giving that demand, then it's going to keep it's going to keep trying to adapt to that demand. Yeah. Um, And in regards to keto, which is interesting because a lot of people get confused with fasting and keto, you know, like what's the difference and really what it comes down to. And I just wanted to point this out to kind of maybe uh, clarify this to your patients is that one of the benefits of fasting is you get into a state called ketosis where you're utilizing fats for fuel. And in fact, fasting is actually the fastest way to get into ketosis, not a ketogenic diet, fasting, not eating because it really forces that ketogenic diet. That's not really a ancestral way of eating, but it is kind of a way to biohack that whole system where you can get into ketosis, but you're still able to eat. Right. And ketosis is powerful because like you mentioned, you're using your, like when you get really unhealthy, bad digestion, you're using your immune response to digest your food. You're getting a ton of inflammation. And part of that inflammation is stemming from your mitochondria, which are these battery producers in your cells that are digesting your food. And what happens is that in normal situations, they release free radicals. And free radicals in normal amounts are great. They're great. They stimulate a lot of good things, cancer, death, uh, post-exercise changes, building lean muscle. But the way we're eating now, we're having such an excessive amount of free radicals produced that excess free radicals directly results in inflammation. And not only does insulin resistance relate to every chronic disease out there, it's also inflammation. And so we find that being in a ketosis state, whether it's from fasting or a ketogenic diet, gives us a lot of the same benefits of fasting, but not certainly not all. I don't think you're going to get the stem cell activation, the autophagy and things of doing a ketogenic diet but I think you are going to be getting a lot of the brain-derived neurotrophic factor, the enhanced mental clarity. You're going to certainly be switching your body's fuel mechanism from sugar to fats, which is great. And uh, you're going to see a lot of that fat loss. So you're going to get some of the benefits of fasting doing a ketogenic diet, but certainly not all of them, I would say. I, I really like the way you put it because, again, that's why I couldn't – we had this conversation. I can't separate the two because – you could just jump on the diet, but if you're not intermittent fasting, you're still overeating. 
you're still right. we're, we're still over consuming food which is straining that body and never gets a break right uh, the, i, I is, like yeah I, which is why i have all my patients who want to do a ketogenic diet they're always combining that with intermittent fasting you're yeah. still doing a ketogenic diet but you're shortening the eating window a little bit because then you're getting the best of both worlds right Yep. But you also want to be careful for long-term ketosis. I don't think doing that for a strictly long time is beneficial either for your hormones and for your energy. I think it's good to cycle in and out occasionally. For me, I like to cycle in almost on a daily basis at nighttime, but you know, you don't want to do it. I would just be a little bit weary of doing it long-term due to thyroid complications as well as hormone problems. You know, and, and that is a, it seems like a subtle point. That's a major point. And mm -hmm. I, I, again, a myth, a myth busting. If we're going to speak frankly on it, then I would say it's exactly why I'm teaching a course on Cairo Keto. And the point is, you, I, I don't want, I'm not promoting ketosis 100% of the time. I'm promoting the adaptability and the mm -hmm. reboot, the metabolic reboot that actually get your body in a fat burning state, but you're in and out, in and out with flexibility. And that is, that's flexibility in life and health. That's flexibility. Like we talked about from depravity, like mm -hmm. I can't enjoy foods. No, no, no. It's about enjoying your life, but having a system that actually allows you to have your best body and health, minimizing chronic disease, cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, um, diabetes type three, which is a whole nother conversation, which is Alzheimer's and dementia. Yeah. Right. Insulin, insulin resistance in your brain. You got Absol it. Absolutely. So, so, I mean, I find this super, we could keep talking. We could keep, th this is great. Dr. Mike, we're going to definitely have you back. I know you want to talk about a couple other things too, as a, as a, mm -hmm. well, you're, you're a bodybuilder, you know, you're a bodybuilder, you know, but not, not the traditional bodybuilder. Yeah, I like, uh, like, obviously, I like to uh, have a good amount of muscle mass. I do. And so if you're going for, and this is very important, for, if you're going for strictly longevity, having, uh, you know, not doing a ton of strength training on a daily basis is probably not what you want to do for longevity. But you also... For longevity, you also got to have this balance. You know, I look at longevity and I also look at um, optimal function and I like to have this balance. And sometimes to have optional functioning, you're sacrificing a little bit of longevity. But the, the, um, the end result is you want to have that beautiful balance, kind of like I was talking about insulin. The lower you can keep insulin, your longevity goes through the roof. But you also got to have those refeeds to increase muscle repair. And to have that increase in mTOR. So you got to have this proper balance of optimal function where I can do all of these athletic endeavors and all this stuff, but also longevity in mind. You don't want to be all on longevity side or all on just building, building, building side. You really want to have that balance. So you're getting the best of both worlds that way. And that's where I just think it comes down to balance. You know, your body doesn't like to be in that same state every time. You have sleep wake cycles. We have go through periods of eating and not eating. We have that parasympathetic nervous system, which is rest, digest, repair, and then your sympathetic, your fight or flight. So your body has all of these states. It doesn't like to be in this flat line state all the time. So it's all about achieving that proper balance. And that's why I really just try to strive for on a daily basis. Boom. Boom. I like it. Yeah. And it's balance. That's what we're trying to teach is balance. And uh, the physiology, that's, that's where Dr. Mike is hitting this really hard. Uh, in terms of just looking at it from a nuts and ooh, which way am I getting here? Okay, let's try Good. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, All right. Where can Dr. Mike? Where can people find you? Where can they find your book? Yep. Um, the book everywhere. Amazon's the easiest way. Just type in intermittent fasting or my name, and it'll pop right up there. So Amazon's a great way. Um, I do a lot of YouTube lectures. So YouTube.com/slash Dr. Michael Van DC. You're going to um, go ahead and subscribe to that channel and you'll get to check out all sorts of free and awesome health information, um, muscle building information, fasting information that's free on that website. So those are two great resources to find me. Awesome. Uh, yeah. do you have, uh, and you recently have kind of checked out a practice, so you're not seeing patients currently. 
Currently, uh, within the last month, yeah. So I'm going to be focusing more on the online presence. I just can, you know, find myself able to help more people and really following my passion doing that and also helping my wife with her practice. Oh, that's awesome. You know, so, I love it. So just a new it. road, you know, still kind of constantly trying to find my way, you know, we never have it perfect the first time. And so just trying different things. But Dr. Wade, I want to thank you. Uh, we met at the social summit and uh, in Atlanta and uh, it was just your, your realness and your, um, you know, your genuine friendliness. I really, uh, you know, gravitated to, and I think your patients are lucky to have you. Thanks. Thanks. I, I, we certainly loved having you today, Dr. Mike. And I've, again, I appreciated everything I learned in your book and uh, have been applying it since. So you've clarified and you've been able to allow me to help more of my patients with, with a lot of that information as well. So thank you. I appreciate you being here. And uh, till next time, folks, we will see Dr. Mike again. So, all right. All right. Thanks. Let's do it again soon. See ya. Hey guys, before you head out, I just want to thank you so much for listening. And I want you to remember your health lies within support it, nurture it, and you will allow it to flow through you. Okay, my fellow health warriors, it's time to head over to iTunes, frankly speaking, drwade.com. There, you can rate, review, and subscribe, as well as share, so more of our brothers and sisters can grow to realize their voice and their health. Speaking up means you matter. We'll see you next time.